Good morning to all of you. I warmly welcome everyone for today's CPD program organized by Government Medical AIM and no late attendees will be entertained thereafter. You will be given CPD points which are strictly adhered to NCCPD guidelines. Apart from CPD points, you will be given an e-certificate for participation. Each attendee should attend to the end of webinar to obtain the certificate. The link for applying a certificate will be sent to you through the chat box at the end of session. Also, we kindly ask you to mute your microphones and switch off videos to avoid any interruption during the session. Today, our session is on uterine fibroids, recent advancements in the management. So now let me introduce our speaker for today. Today, our resource person is Dr. Dilok Senadira, consultant obstetrician and gynecologist in Castle Street Hospital for Women, Colombo. So, without further delay, I would like to invite Dr. Dilok Senadira to start the session. Over to you, sir. Uh, very good morning to, morning to all of you. And Malati, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. And Malati, thank you. Right. Give me one second, please. Right. In the meantime, once that is sorted, um, there are a few questions people have sent. So uh, can we go through them first? Is that okay? Right. Right. Okay. So, uh, well, all of us know about fibroids, isn't it? Uh, but however, having said that, there are, you know, new developments in relation to management of fibroids. So um, we, some of it may not be really in clinical practice yet, but however, uh, they might come into our day-to-day -day work very soon. And we're going to touch upon these things a little bit. If you look at the uh, presenting slide, so this first little picture is a robotic myomectomy, a Da Vinci robot, and these are the instruments of the robot. and. Uh, is very similar to laparoscopy, but it has certain advantages. The lady smiling at you uh, is from a certain ethnic origin. And, uh, you know, there are racial differences, ethnic differences um, in, uh, uh, you know, about uh, the rates of fibroids. Uh, race can become one of the risk factors. And the last picture is about one of the newer technologies that is dissolution of fibroids with ultrasound waves and uh, heat waves. So there are newer techniques that we're going to talk about. Right. Then I'm going to run through your questions that they have sent. Right. Investigations and uh, diagnosis. You just start to enlarge after what size of fibroid? Well, it's a very difficult question to answer. So basically, the whole crux of, crux of the question is, at what uh, size of enlargement of the fibroid, the uterus would become enlarged? Well, that's a very um, difficult question to answer. The uterus would become palpable abdominally when it comes above the pubic symphysis, that is somewhere around 12 week size. These are non-scientific, but very crude measurements. With a bimanual palpation, you can compare it to being six week size, eight week size, 10 week size, and a 12 week size of a gravid uterus. So, what size of fibroids would be, make it to become enlarged? Well, there's no certain answer for it. Yeah? Fine. <clears throat> uh, then the next question is uh, approach to finding fibroids for the first time uh, time during antenatal visits. Any special consideration regarding pregnancy? Right. Most of the fibroids are asymptomatic, isn't it? The majority of the fibroids are asymptomatic. So in pregnancy, they can become symptomatic. Pregnant symptoms could be whole spectrum, starting from vaginal bleeding to uh, abdominal pain to high rates of miscarriage to high rate of preterm labor to the whole lot of spectrum of symptoms in pregnancy. So if you're vigilant, you can really suspect them and then do ultrasound scan and di direct the patient to an ultrasound scan and uh, possibly diagnose them. Uh, 
this ever famous red degeneration generally happens around mostly in the second trimester, beginning of the second trimester, where the fibroid starts to enlarge with higher levels of hormones in the system. So that would be cent central necrosis and causing red, de red degeneration and pain. So it's going to be, you know, if the patient has large fibroids, it's going to be a bit of a tricky journey uh, with handling the pain with painkillers throughout the pregnancy. Then uh, most of these questions that we are going to talk about uh, while we are in the lecture. And what about the leomyosarcomas? Is that common in Asians? Um, leomyosarcomas are not common at all. The quoted rates are less than 0.3%. Uh, uh, various studies describe it in various statistics. General consensus is it's, you know, nearly 1 in 8,000 to 1 in 400. That's the range that is given. So if you go to the lower limit, if you see 400 fibroids, one could be a leomyosarcoma. But some parts of the world, it could be as rare as 1 in 10,000. So is it common in Asians? No. We are not one of the uh, races to have uh, leomyosarcomas commonly. But in uh, women in Black African origin, yes, it's common. Uh, then, uh, can we remain untreated? Uh, if the fibroids are less than three centimeters, absolutely yes. Most majority of the fibroids do not need any treatment. They are symptomatic. Unless a fibroid causes symptoms, we are not going to uh, do anything about it. The basic principle is unless the fibroid troubles you, we are not going to trouble the fibroid as well. Uh, because we, these are benign tumors, isn't it? What about hormone therapy? Yes, if what if you mean by this question is um, the re hormonal ablation of the fibroids, yes, we use it in clinical practice. But if you are meaning, uh, if your question is about hormone replacement therapy and fibroids, well, there's no issue. You can start hormone re uh, replacement therapy, even though fibroids are hormone responsive. For HRT, the levels are very low. The clinically given doses are very low. So then you can easily start uh, uh, HRT on women with fibroids. It wouldn't cause massive difference. Uh, surgical options. We're going to talk about then treatment with minimally minimal effect on fertility. We're going to talk, talk about them, the laparoscopy, hysteroscopy, and other modalities. Uh, best option for nulliparous women. Well, this is a very subjective thing. Uh, if you have a fibroid, if you are symptomatic, there are a few ways of treating it. One thing, we all know it can be a hysterectomy. Another and other one is it could be, th these are the surgical options, isn't it? Other option is, of course, a myomectomy. Myomectomy could be an open myomectomy, laparoscopic myomectomy, or hysteroscopic myomectomy. There are ablative techniques as well upcoming ablative techniques but what to choose there are criterias but these criteria very well overlaps with each other so it's all about proper case selection for each procedure there's no gold standard but whenever possible we today's world we always try to um, give priority for laparoscopy for obvious reasons if it's suitable for laparoscopic resection that would be the first choice. Right. So best option for nulliparous? Yes. We're going to talk about it in the lecture. Can laparoscopy be used as management of choice? Yes. What is the best treatment modality for uterine fibrils in young females? Well, as I said, we'll, it's all about case selection. What are the contraindications for hysteroscopic fibroid removal? Well, large fibroids cannot be removed through the hysteroscope. In, generally, the accepted consensus is if the fibroid is type 0, type 1, type 2, and if it's less than 3 centimeters, well, you can try hysteroscopic resection. So we are going to talk about the types of the fibroid, fibroids. And uh, if it's slightly larger fibroid, let's assume it's about 4 centimeters or 5 centimeters, we can try a volume reduction with oral medication or injections, then try for a hysteroscopic uh, uh, removal of the fibroid.
So all of these options may have to be combined in certain instances. Uh, what are the right? Then what are the criteria for the myomectomy? What is the treatment for fibroids which uh, identify while on pregnancy? In pregnancy, we try and avoid treatment for fibroids unless it is markedly symptomatic. It can be really troublesome, but all you're going to have to do, all you're left with is controlling her pain. But in certain instances, emergencies can happen. Let's assume a type 7 fibroid, that is a fibroid which is outside the uterine cavity and twisted or torted, and the necrosis happens and she will be going into systemic inflammation. In that instance, we have uh, left with no options, then of course we might have to go in and do a surgery and take it out. Generally, fibroids which are within the myometrium, we tend to not to operate. Uh, if you have to operate, we try and delay the uh, surgery at least up until 20 weeks where the miscarriage rates would be slightly low. The risk is if you disturb the myometrium, there's a practical risk that the pregnancy would go out. So it's all, <sighs> about managing symptoms with pain relief, unless it's an emergency. <clears throat> then, uh, right, if cesarean, is cesarean section preferred as a mode of delivery in patient, in a patient with fibroid uh, with otherwise normal pregnancy? Absolutely not. Right, so sometimes, women with fibroid, fibroid complicating pregnancy, a vaginal surgery would be, uh, uh, cesarean section would be better. A vaginal uh, delivery would be better. So then it's again about clinical judgment. If there is a large fibroid obstructing the lower segment and preventing the engagement of the baby, and preventing the baby coming down, of course, you are left with no options, then you'll have to think of a cesarean section. Sometimes it may be a classical cesarean section with uh, a scar in the upper uterine body, a vertical scar. But if everything else is normal, if the head, baby gets engaged nicely and the fibroid is somewhere else outside the uterus or maybe high up into the high up in the fundus, there's no reason for us to push the patient into a cesarean section. Vagina delivery, of course, would be better in that instance. Uh, it has to be decided by case by case. But with fibroids, should it be a cesarean section? Absolutely not. Then the next question. Well, we are uh, going into a lot of time with these questions, I think. Mm, what is the management that can be given at OPD initially? Well, the treatment could be addressing the etiology of the fibroid, those are hormone treatment, and then the symptom control. That is where we start with your simple tranexamic acid. We'll talk about all of these things in the lecture. Can we manage non-suspicious young patients symptomatically without any investigations? Yes, managing the pain, bleeding episode, and the miserable loop, you can talk about these things. Risk of becoming cancerous. Okay, fine. Right, I think that should be enough, and we're going to move into the lecture now. Okay. Can I control the slides with the keys? What happens here? It's less. So I can't answer your questions at the same time. So, yeah, all right, fine. Okay, right. So we are here. All right. So, leomimas are the commonest. All of us know about these facts, but I'm just stressing some of the things for the benefit of. Uh, Maybe there are postgraduate trainees here and people who are interested. So the UMIMAs are the commonest monoclonal, monoclonal smooth muscle uterine tumors. They're single origin mostly, monoclonal, and occurring in about 40 to 60% of women, depending on the race. And they're mostly benign, while true leo, uh, leo, myo, uh, leo, leo myoma, leomyosarcoma transformation being very rare. As we know, most of the cancerous counterparts diagnosed later are missed leomyomas. Could be missed leomyomas from the beginning. We think, okay, it's a fibroid. Then sub subsequently, few years later, we diagnose it as a leomyosarcoma. So what about the risk that we have diagnosed a leomyosarcoma wrongly as a fibroid? That has been the case in most of the instances. 
they have been missed leomyosarcomas. But the true transformation from a fibroid to the cancerous counterpart is much rare. And uh, these are hormone responsive tumors and are composed of large amounts of extracellular matrix containing collagen, fibronectin, and proteoglycans. And it has its importance, and I'll uh, take you through about it. The therapeutic options for long term treatment of uterine fibers have been very limited. For the past 100 years, surgery has been the mainstay. And it might uh, change in the future and uh, render us gynecologists jobless. We never know. Right. Nearly about 2,000 hysterectomies and nearly about 300,000 myomectomies and thousands of selective uterine artery embolizations happen annually in the USA alone. So that tells the gravity of it. In at most parts of the world, it's generally a surgery yet. The development of several non-invasive surgical techniques and medical options are showing promise. We are talking about targeted gene therapy and other ablative techniques and specific uh, tumor suppressive therapy. All of these things are in the limelight. Many patients are asymptomatic while nearly 30% seek treatment. It is a leading cause of gynecological morbidity in women. It's most productive life years, if you think of it, imparting a significant socioeconomic impact. The sh they show a spectrum of symptom symptoms depending on the location and the size of the fibroid. Simple thing that all uh, simple thing that we encounter day in our day to day practice is you know heavy menstrual bleeding, needing multiple blood transfusions, dysmenorrhea, the pelvic pain are frequently encountered. Then the pressure symptoms. You know, if the fibroid is pressing onto the bladder or posteriorly onto the rectum, it could impart pressure symptoms. And uh, it could be bowel dysfunction, uterine dis uh, the bladder dysfunction, small bladder syndrome, all of these could happen. It can rarely impinge on the ureters, causing hydronephrosis and hydroureter, and subsequently, the later, the kidney failure, uh, causing devastating complications. Fibroids do impair fertility through several mechanisms. It's not only the fibroid which is in, you know, protruding into the cavity. Anatomic distortion of the tubes and the alteration to uh, endometrial and tubal function, effect on endomyometrial blood supply, effect on junctional zone. There are many theories, uh, effects on the natural uh, killer cells mechanism and the hoxetine expression, increase uterine contractility, alteration of local hormone milieu within the uh, endometrium and paracrine molecular changes, impaired gamete pickup due to mechanical obstruction uh, that is basically hindrance to the tubes and uh, the ovum transport have all been postulated as mechanisms for reduced fertility. So it's not only that little fibroid uh, impinging into the uterine cavity. They can give rise to plethora of symptoms in pregnancy, placing a substantial strain on existing health services and all. Uh, altering obstetric outcomes, preterm delivery, primary cesarean sections, and breech presentations and low birth weight infants have been commonly observed, while shorter cervical lengths have been described in fibroid complicating pregnancies recently. That may be one of the reasons they might uh, go into preterm labor. Right. Okay, so then what about the risk factors? Well, we all know about the risk factors. Uh, race, age, early menarche, parity, higher the parity, less as the chance of uh, getting fibroids and other factors, obesity, high blood pressure, red meat consumption, and uh, you know sedentary lifestyle. All of these can uh, give rise to high rates of fibroids. Caffeine and alcohol have been postulated. Smoking could even actually be protective. Um, then uh, genetic factors and all of these are proven. Right, then we are going to have a little look at the classification. Traditionally, most of us uh, classify fibroids as subserosal, submucosal, intramural. Well, that's the easy way. But however, a more clinically oriented, more treatment oriented way would be a scientific uh, classification. There are a few axes. Uh, ESG classification, European Society of Gyne Endoscopy classification is simple, very simple. But then again, FIGO classification provides more objective evaluation, so everybody could use it, use it very easily. If you see here, type 0 fibroid means a pedunculated fibroid with a peduncle protruding into the cavity. Type 1 means 
more than 50% of the fibroid is towards the cavity. Type 2 means less than 50% towards the cavity and majority of the fibroid is towards the myometrium. Type 3 means it's intramural and can in contact with the endometrium. 4 is 100% intramural. It's neither contact, contracting the uh, endometrium or the serosa. Type 5, the same thing. Majority is fibroid still within the womb, but it's touching the serosa. And type 6 means fibroid is going out of the uterus now, and more than 50% of it is out of the uterus. And type 7 means sub serosal pedunculated fibroid. And so, what if the fibroid is touching both the serosa and the submucosa, serosa and the submucosa? Then we can classify it as type 2 5. Uh, type 8 is classified as fibroids in distant places. Could be a parasitic fibroid, it could be a cervical fibroid, it could be a fibroid in the, one of the uterine ligaments. And we have seen fibroids in the, you know, anterior vaginal wall, posterior vaginal wall, near the urethra. So it could be in any place where smooth muscle proliferation can happen rarely. Right. Then this is about that classification. Uh, if you go with the broader classification again, submucosal ones are the type 0 and type 1 within the uterine cavity. Intramural is type 2 to type 5. Out of the uterus, sub zero, sir, 6 to 8. Right. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the evaluation of the fibroid. Classically, over the years, over the decade, last few decades, simple ultrasound transabdominal scan in combination with transvaginal scan have been the first line investigation. It has many advantages and it's one of the most cost effective methods and it's a very simple test. And MRI and fibroid mapping, well, it's not indicated in all cases, only when we have a doubt, especially the origin of the fibroid, etiology of the condition, or if you are suspecting a leomyosarcoma, whether there's an adenomyotic component, very large fibroids, difficult to assess with ultrasound scanning. And uh, before the uh, assisted reproductive techniques, sometimes in these specific instances, MRI would hold an advantage. Otherwise, in most cases, simple ultrasound would be more than enough. Saline infusion sonography, that helps for the cavity evaluation. We put a bit of saline into the trunk cavity and see where the fibroid is. High cosy is the same principle that is hysterocontrast sonography. Instead of water, there'll be uh, contrast material within the uterine cavity and looking at the uh, fibroid margins. And the COPH, that is conscious outpatient hysteroscopy. That is, you do hysteroscopy as an office procedure, as a clinic procedure for the evaluation of the fibroids. So it's done under, uh, you know, without anesthesia and uh, under a couple of analgesic tablets. Uh, and it will give us a good cavity evaluation and looking directly into the uterine cavity. A new tool, 3D ultrasound with coronal plane reconstruction for the cavity evaluation is one of the brilliant tools. It would avoid your MRI because you can gather almost the same amount of information. And it's one of the newer techniques. Some of the latest ultrasound scans has this 3D technology, but if you have it, use it because it's almost equal to an MRI if you do it in the correct way. Right. So, right. So, ultrasound, it's widely available, economical, non invasive, painless means of investigating, high sensitivity and specificity. Uh, generally, fibroid is seen as a well defined rounded lesion within the myometrium or be, uh, belonging to it, frequently with shadows at the edge or an internal fan shaped shadow. People who are doing ultrasound scans would really know what I'm talking about at the moment. Uh, Doppler ultrasound reveals circumferential flow around the fibroid. We call it ring of fire. And these are one of the hallmarks in differentiating adenomyoma from the fibroids. Fibroids are usually hypoechoic or isoechoic. The cogenicity varies depending on the level of uh, calcification and the quantity of fibrous tissue. Sometimes a fibroid has an enochoic component. This happens due to dissolution of the fibroid, the central necrosis. You might see a halo only the capsule, especially in older women. 
So uh, minimum distance, uh, the location of the fibroid, the fibroid mapping, all that can be done very easily with a good quality ultrasound scan machine. Right. Right, gone line. So differential diagnosis. Can it be tricky? Mm, well, at times, not mostly. The differential diagnosis of uterine masses is of crucial importance. Could be adenomyosis, endometrial polyps, or solid tumors of the adenexia. Could be, could it be a fibro, uh, fibroma or ovarian fibrothecoma? These are solid tumors, can be misdiagnosed as fibroids. The distinction should be made between diffuse and focal adenomyosis. Differentiation from adenomyomas can be challenging at times, especially when both pathologies are present. Uh, in a coexisting manner. Color Doppler may be really useful. I'll show you a couple of pictures there. So ultrasound markers that indicate the presence of adenomyosis varies. Uh, it could be an asymmetrical thickening of the wall. Unlike fibrous, there will be diffuse thickening of the posterior wall mostly and sometimes the anterior wall as well. There will be striae-like vascular lakes. It's quite different to a fibroid. In a fibroid, the blood vessels run through the neurovascular plane. It does not penetrate into the fibroid. However, in adenomyosis, the picture is quite different. There'll be lots of blood lakes within the lesion. So there'll be myometrial seeds, hyperechoic islands and strips. We call it strab strabicat appearance and irregular interrupted junctional zones. All of these can be useful in differentiating fibroids from adenomyomas. Right, this is what I was talking about. If you look at the first picture here, uh, <clears throat> this is adenomyosis. There are lots of plastic, this is a, uh, Power Doppler color flow, and uh, there are lots of placental, liver, lots of uh, vascular lakes, and in a striated manner, and within the lesion. So this is more of an adenomyosis, adenomyoma, anterior wall adenomyoma. But if you look at the other one here, it's very circumferential, and it gives a ghostly outline. The, uh, the blood vessels do not penetrate into the fibroid, and it's a hallmark of a fibroid. Right, as I said, MRI may provide slight advantage in specific cases. Right, this is saline infusion sonography. If you look at the first picture, it's quite difficult to evaluate the cavity. We can see only the cavity outline. But what we have done here is put a bit of saline into the uterine cavity with the catheter. Could be a folic catheter into the, into the uterine cavity or could be a specific catheter for it. Or a simple saline tube, a drip set. Uh, in the uterine cavity, and we infuse small amount of uh, saline up to about 80 millimeters of mercury, the pressures for the uterine cavity distension, where the cavity would start opening up, and then we see a fibroid, a type one fibroid, a type two fibroid. Majority of the fibroid is within the uh, myometrium, and it's impinging onto the cavity. This fibroid can certainly affect the fertility. So if you don't have the facility for the MRI, this simple technique would give you more in-depth evaluation of the fibroid. Right, this is a 3D ultrasound, right? This is the 2D image and this is the two, 3D image. So as you can see, there's much more information is visible when we do the coronal pain reconstruction of the uterine cavity. See, the fibroid is in relation to the uterine cavity. It's touching, but it's away not distorting the cavity. Cavity is uh, shown as a nice triangular area. So it has certain advantages and we can look all around the uh, uterus, mapping each fibroid correctly. So permits reconstruction of the coronal plane of the uterus, exact location and the proximity to the uterine cavity can be evaluated and especially before assisted reproductive techniques. And this may avoid uh, these uh, uh, hysteroscopies and other uh, surgical techniques. So this can be done as an office procedure, simple ultrasound scan with a 3D machine. Right, so the medical options. This diagram, sorry about this, what happened? Right, this diagram shows us the uh, treatment options actually, yeah, in a very simplified manner. So when you think of fibroids, there is certain thing, the definitive treatment. There are, those are the surgical options. It could be a hysterectomy or a myomectomy in different ways. And traditional medical options have been, it, 
one section, one entity of it is for the symptom control, where we trust on tranexamic acid, uh, the antifibrinolytics, the commonest symptom is heavy menstrual bleeding. To control that, tranexamic acid would be a simple and one of the most effective ways. Uh, your NSAIDs may not be really affecting in controlling the blood flow, but if the patient has pain for some reason, yes, that might help. Then again, fibroids are not really painful as well in general conditions. Red degeneration can be painful, but all the other types, let's say senile degeneration, cystic degeneration, highland degeneration, these types are not painful. But having said that, can the can fibroids cause chronic pelvic pain? Absolutely, yes. Reason is sometimes they can go and impinge on other organs. Let's say it's pressing on your rectum, it's pressing onto the bladder. So it can cause uh, chronic pelvic pain in these situations, instances. But generally, the fibroids as a principle are not painful. If you have an enlarged uterus with fibroids and with a lot of pain and heavy menstrual bleeding, it may not only be fibroids, it could be coexisting adenomyosis as well. So oral contraceptives can be tried. People have been trying progesterones, oral progesterones, injectables, DMPA is known to uh, suppress the development of fibroids, intrauterine devices, the myrina coil, uh, the coil with levonorgestrel, uh, which has about 52 milligrams, 51 milligrams, uh, and can be kept for five years and releases about 20 microns of uh, levonorgestrel per day. So all of these things can be tried, especially if there is no cavity distortion, if the fibroid is small, you can try and talk about the myrina coil insertion. And NSAIDs, as I said, may not be really helpful in preventing blood flow, but it might help pain. And tranexamic acid and others we have talked about. And uh, some of these uh, drugs which are not here, let's say gestrinone, antiprogesterones, and mifepristone, gestrinone, all of these drugs have been tried with various degrees of success, but what preclude them? Uh, coming into the wide clinical practice is this, of course, the side effects. Let's say danazol, it's a fantastic drug. It controls heavy menstrual bleeding, gives certain uh, amount of reduction, but the problem is devastating side effects. Uh, after six months of treatment, you don't want to uh, see a patient who's coming with permanent hoarseness of voice, which can happen after danazol. So they're not really popular nowadays. And the next option is, you know, GnRH analogs and the selective progesterone receptor modulators, perms and the GnRH analogs. Both of these drugs are fantastic tools, but however, only in carefully selected cases because they do not really address the pathology. They would suppress the disease, but after the discontinuation of the treatment, they would come back. Somebody who's at the verge of menopause or perimenopause, if you want to suppress the symptoms, you can try these GnRH analogs and uh, sperms because at one point she's bound to get menopause and the hormone levels would go down so there wouldn't be any further growth of fibroids. Yes, it's a good option. And somebody who wants uh, fertility treatment, awaiting assisted reproductive techniques and slightly larger fibroids, about four centimeters, we want to make it smaller and go for a pregnancy without removing the myo fibroid without a myomectomy. So we won't avoid the myomectomy. In that instance, fine, yes, it might be helpful. And there are large fibroids. We want to plan our su surgery in such a way so that we would not lose much uh, blood and we want to minimize the damage to the myometrium. So we want to shrink the fibroid. In that instance, yes, this would be helpful, but not as a specific treatment option. So these are the newer surgical options. The uterine artery embolization, it has have been there for some decades now, and fibroid ablation, and magnetic resonance, focus ultrasound, and ultrasound guided dissolution, and there are other techniques. I'll take you through them uh, in the later slides. Right. In the past, estrogen was considered to be the major growth factor. We think, okay, it's the estrogen that causes the growth of the fibroid. Mm, it may not be true, actually. The progesterone acts as the key hormone in the development. Progesterone receptor A and B found to be in very high concentration in the leomyoma tissue in the smooth muscle cells. So the PCNA and the mitotic index high in luteal phase. That tells us something. In the luteal phase, progesterone levels are high. Even though we think it's the estrogen, no, it's the luteal phase that the fibroids get enlarged. Mitotic index goes high, there will be rapid cell proliferation. So it's the 
progesterone who's really driving the growth of the fibroids. And it increases the mitotic traits, reducing apoptosis of fibroids in the smooth muscle cells. These apoptotic pathways are really suppressed in the fibroids. Second messengers, the I3K and AKT pathways is mediated by progesterone promoter of alleomyoma. Signaling occurs between estrogen and progesterone receptors. Estrogen induces increased expression of the progesterone receptor in the fibroid cell. That's how the estrogen comes into the action. Estrogen, yes, high doses can uh, increase the growth rate through a progesterone modulated pathway, not directly. That's the whole point. In postgraduate exams, sometimes I've seen these as MCQs. <clears throat> okay. Right. Then, uh, sperms, selective progesterone receptor modulators. There are many drugs now. The mostly the common, commonly known drugs are mifepristone, aspracinil, and telapristone, and ulipristal acetate, which is the common drug that we talk about. And it has shown a lot of promise. Uh, all these drugs are shown to decrease leomyoma size and reduce uterine bleeding in a dose-dependent manner. So the myoma volume reduction could be anything from 30 to 50 percent or maybe slightly less. Sperms can downregulate the number of growth factors, reduces collagen synthesis in fibroid cells, so it overall addresses the issue. And sperms act upon the endometrium, reducing bleeding. That's one of the hallmarks of uh, progesterone receptor modulators because anemia can be corrected very quickly with ulipristal acetate. But it's not without side effects, so you can't continue for a long and uh, hepatotoxicity and uh, renal toxicity have been issues. Uh, so um, for a medical unhealthy patient or a patient who's at an advanced age or uh, uh, in, in an, even in a normal patient, you cannot continue it for a long time. You cannot continue for years and years. It could be either in three months, six months, and mostly one year, not beyond that. The problem is just like GNR, GNRH analogs, this will give rise to regrowth of the fibroid when the drugs are discontinued. So these drugs are started when you have a specific treatment plan only. If you think that you are going to reduce the size of the fibroid with these medical treatment options and then go for a surgery, yes, good. Otherwise, would it be a permanent treatment option? Unlikely. Fine. These are, you know, some of the research articles just to show you there'll be a significant volume reduction with all of these drugs. Yeah compared to placebo. That is a significant volume reduction. And the one thing to note is, okay, when we do an ultrasound scan, sometimes we tend to forget the concept of diameter and the volume. Uh, the fibroid may go down very slightly in size, but that may tell there might be a significant volume reduction. Look at this now. A 10% volume reduction would push down the diameter only by 3%. A three centimeters initial size fibroid after one course of ulipristal acetate, after treatment of three, cent, uh, three months, maybe with GnRH analogs, be it Solidex, be it uh, um, Liprolite Depot, and it has come down 2.9 centimeters. We might think, okay, there's not enough reduction in the size of the fibroid, but however, the volume has gone down by 10%. Yeah. If there's a 30% reduction, there would be on the diameter reduction would be roughly around 12%. That is, initial size of the fibroid is about 3 centimeters. It has gone down slightly in the diameter. But there is a huge amount of uh, myometrial volume has gone down. This is important. This is quite important when you're doing scanning. So if, you are use, if we are using uh, ulipristal acetate, it can be used in many ways. I'm not going to go into technical details here. But generally, as a rule of thumb pre-surgically, 5 milligrams daily, and alternating with two menses or as a single course up to three cycles can be used. There will be significant uh, uh, amount of symptom control, and it allows rapid control of the symptoms, produces amenorrhea in nearly in almost all cases. And decreasing their volume by 40 to 50 percent after 12 months of treatment in a similar manner as GNR analogs, but can be used, can be considered as a first line if symptomatic treatment is not effective. Two steps the first one uh, regarding the stabilization and recovery of anemia, and the second phase is related to maintenance for some time. If relapse is expected, 
After treatment with these drugs, you can go for a simple version of the progesterone, such as give you crystal acetate, then go for LNG IUS, myrinacoid, or uh, maybe a DMPA uh, regimen. So all these drugs in combination might help, but the problem with these drugs is they're not freely available and uh, they may not be licensed in some situations and they are very, very expensive. Right, so I included this slide just to show some of the outcomes, GNRH versus ulipristal acetate. It's very similar, but rapid, rapid control of uh, symptoms compared to GNRH analogs. And uh, the fibroid regrowth may not be as same as GNRH analogs. GNRH analogs will be generally when you discontinue, within about one year, fibroids would regrow to the previous size. Ulipristal acetate, they would have some baseline effect and keep suppressing the fibroids for certain time. Right, so the median times to control bleeding were shorter in the UPA group and uh, then the GNRH agonist group. Faster correction of anemia may have a relatively sustained effect. GNRH agonists rapid growth of their fibroids after discontinuation and progesterone receptor modulator associated endometrial changes, paces, are a concern whether then ulipristal acetate and other sperms can cause endometrial cancers. No, it has found to be, uh, it's not endometrial hyperplasia or pre-malignant lesions. These are benign and reversible changes in the endometrium and they disappear within two months of discontinuation of the drug. So sa safety has been very well established. When definite treatment is needed, surgical therapy is still preferred over medical therapy. Even in today's world, Mostly, when you need definitive therapy, it's going to be, unfortunately, a surgery. And sensible and thorough preoperative assessment is essential to determine the surgical strategy according to the size and location of, and the number. I want to stress the point here. The fibroids are asymptomatic. Generally, they do not cause trouble to the patient. So for these innocent tumors, we surgeons should not go and trouble them as well. Unless a fibroid troubles you, we are not going to trouble the fibroid. So the majority of, in, of the cases, your primary job should be to postulate and uh, when not to operate. Every fibroid doesn't warrant a surgery. Having said that, in certain instances, you need a surgery. If you need a surgery due to symptoms or for some other reason, Hard days, you need a surgery. So, important thing is a precise preoperative diagnosis will indicate whether a hysteroscopic resection or a laparoscopic myomectomy is feasible. And we need to be realistic with our expectations as well. Sometimes patients do request laparoscopic or hysteroscopic resection, but however, it may not be the best option in certain instances. Whether a laparotomy should be performed for numerous or large fibroids, that's the point that I want to stress if it's a large fibroid about 10 to 15 centimeters maybe larger the largest fibroid i've ever removed is nearly about five kilos four point something 4.8 kilos so these are huge fibroids a laparoscopy a tiny camera wouldn't work work on them laparoscopic cryomyelitis and thermocoagulation laparoscopic or vaginal occlusion of the uterine arteries have all been tried with various degrees of success each approach has its own advantages and disadvantages Right, look at this picture. Now, the picture on your left side, this is opened up uterus actually. And this is a large fibroid with a peduncle, large peduncle, right? Uh, Over-enthusiastic surgeon here has been me. We were trying to remove this fibroid with the hysteroscope. That's, I would accept its poor preoperative assessment. It's quite a large fibroid. Entire, true, it's a type 0 fibroid. It's quite large. We wouldn't be able to take this through, out through the hysteroscope. Number one, it's too large. There'll be too much of debris. Number two, there's a huge peduncle with a significant amount of blood, uh, blood supply. We wouldn't be able to diatomize and control the bleeding here. So this should have been straight away an open surgery, not a converted surgery. Of course, we were trying and seeing whether we can avoid open surgery. That's what happened here. In this instance, uh, well, I'm not the culprit here. Uh, we always learn with somebody else's mistakes. So this is a tiny fibroid. This poor lady, a young girl, had to undergo an open surgery. 
yeah, whereas this could have been an easy resection and could have easily taken out through the hysteroscope. The fibroid is within the uterine cavity. This is a cesarean like incision, a scar opening into the uterus, and a tiny fibroid, less than three centimeters, should have been a hysteroscopic resection. True that we don't have the hysteroscopes and laparoscopes on all instances and every setting, but at least we can refer them to a place where the facilities are available rather than pushing the patient to an unnecessary open surgery. Yeah. Then again, look at this. This is about five kilos, and we would have never been able to take this large fibroid through a tiny camera. So even the patient's expectations could be different. You need to explain them. Look, this is not going to be realistic. There are certain number of fibroids, whole amount of fibroids, and the volume is too tricky and too big. We wouldn't be able to uh, do this with the scope. It has to be an open surgery, and uh, which would uh, give you more benefit compared to an, uh, surgery through the scope. Right. So somebody had asked, how do we case select cases for hysteroscopic resection? Right. As I told you before, type 0, type 1, and type 2, these are within the uterine cavity. 0, entirely within the cavity. 1, more than 50%. 2, less than 50%. So if it's less than three centimeters, she's an ideal candidate for a hysteroscopic myomectomy. Advantages are numerous. You don't have a scar. You go home quickly, sometimes within the same day or maybe following day, less pain, less blood loss, less myometrial distortion, more myometrial uh, reserve following the surgery, higher chances of getting pregnant next time. So that is a very good method to remove a fibroid. If it's more than three centimeters, or if you have symptoms such as anemia, you can try medical therapy. As I said before, you can try ultrasound acetate, GNR analogs, or maybe DMPA. And if the fibroid goes down, it's, if it stays there, we might not need further treatment. But if it still enlarges, we might have to go for a hysterectomy, a hysteroscopic myomectomy. So for types, the bottom line is for type 0 to type 2 fibroids, hysteroscopic should be the gold standard. And especially if they are less than three centimeters. Figure two fibroids may be a little more difficult to remove because we have to cut off this fibroid in a stepwise manner. We'll be shaving it off in the first instance. Then the fibroid get expelled a little towards the cavity. We might go again and pull it out. But then again, it's a very short surgeries and is you know not very complicated surgeries, and it uh, gives a lot of advantages to the patient. Beyond type 3, when the fibroids are within the myometrium, it's quite difficult to go in and dig with the scope here. It will cause more damage compared to advantages. So if it's really within the myometrium, the his laparoscopy should be the way, not the hysteroscopy. So that is why I said preoperative assessment is very important. Even though these criteria are laid down, clinicians or the surgeons has to be very prudent in selecting their cases and explaining the patient what option would be best for them. Right, this diagram show you uh, about a medical treatment and general principles, how uh, this will guide us uh, in relation to case selection. And you can go through it leisurely. And uh, this basically says is uh, long-term intermittent SPRM therapy can be uh, tried in women who are who desire for a pregnancy and if there's very good response volume reduction more than 50 percent you can go for a uh, try and go for a natural conception and if the volume reduction is not so good you might need to go for other treatment options as well and if the if there are no response the op only option we have left with is a myomectomy and if you don't have a desire for pregnancy and of course, you can try longer term SPRM therapy. And if there is good response, stop treatment. If the treatment is insufficient, go for a definitive surgical option. Right. This is how we, as all of us know, this is through the hysteroscope. We are in the uterine cavity. The surrounding is filled with normal saline. This is a bipolar resectoscope. 
and uh, this is a fibroid less than three centimeters sitting within the uterine cavity of course there are large blood vessels but we can always have bled them so we would shave this and take this out through the hysteroscope through the cervix so there wouldn't be any scars for the patient right this is a tiny video of that happening right we are on a posterior wall you try and fibroid type 2 fibroid we are shaving it off through a diatomy loop yeah we are cutting it into pieces now and all of these tiny pieces would come out through the cervix with this saline Various instruments have been developed for this. Initially, it was monospolar hysteroscope and using glycine and other things and had a lot of complications. Now, the world is moving towards bipolar resectoscopes, which are the easier way out. Right. So, hysteroscopy. What can go wrong? Yes, there are a few things. Complications are infrequent uh, and we do not see major complications nowadays. However, if you are over enthusiastic, if you dig into the myometrium, uterine perforation might happen. So you need to know where the margins or the capsule of the fibroid is. And there are certain markers in demarcating this uh, when you're doing the surgery. And bleeding, infection, and venous intramassation, it's just like a transurethral resection of the prostate. So Terp syndrome uh, uh, kind of picture would happen with a lot of uh, venous absorption of the normal saline and uh, long-term complications such as intrauterine additions can be easily prevented uh, by inserting uh, uh, copper IUCD after the resection and keeping it there for some time and pulling it out then of course once the scar is healed cavity wouldn't have any adhesions so surgical strategy strategies may prevent adhesions monopolar resectoscope increase the risk and proficient surgical technique is mandatory here the duration of endometrial wound recovery varies following surgery a month after a polypectomy if it's a small fibroid polyp or maybe up to three months after a myomectomy so if you need assisted reproductive techniques if you are planning for an ivf if you're planning for a iui and following recurrent miscarriages you had to go uh, in the line of uh, hysteroscopic resection of surgery um, uh, fibroids and then after about three months you can get pregnant we pull out the coil after about three months and let the patient get pregnant right so figure three fibroids and above that is basically within the myometrium the fibroids is within the myometrium intramural and sub cell fibroids are best removed by laparoscopy or laparotomy laparoscopic surgery is the first choice uh, in the absence of contraindications. As I said before, if the facilities are available, why not try it? It has loads of advantages. Laparoscopic myomectomy is widely performed and benefits are noteworthy. And uh, less post-operative, well, all of us know about this, less post-operative pain, short hospital stay, less blood loss, less scarring, faster recovery, higher patient satisfaction, and unscarred abdomens following surgery. All of these things are huge advantages in laparoscopy. And no significant difference was registered between the laparoscopic and abdominal approach in regard with regards to reproductive outcomes. There was a concern certain decades ago uh, when you suture laparoscopically, whether the rupture rates are higher in laparoscopically repaired wombs compared to open surgery. But with proper suture materials, good uh, uh, proficient surgical techniques, and proper case selections, and uh, knowing where to place your scars and how to retrieve fibroids, all these surgical techniques have made a huge difference. In nowadays, in newer trials, rupture rates are not high. It is equal or comparable to open surgery. So challenges in surgery include appropriate use of sutures and the achievement of satisfactory hemostasis. Right. <clears throat> this is, again, a diagram to show how to select your cases. Uh, perimenopausal women without gestational desire it could be about pain control it could be about controlling the disease and then we follow them up and if they are more than 48 years you know if they are uh, nearing the age of menopause 
and you can try medical treatment a couple of times. If it goes down fine, you don't need to do anything, anything about it further. If they are relatively younger, still persist symptoms, then we might need to uh, go for a definitive a treatment, hysterectomy or a nevatechnic. And women with gestational desire, people who want a child, sub zero cell fibroid, if they are symptomatic, the hysteroscopy should be the option. Type 3 and beyond laparoscopy can easily be tried with or without medical treatment before the surgery. And uh, generally, up to about 5 to 6 centimeters through the laparoscope, the fibroids can be easily operated. If they are larger, of course, you can still operate, but the specimen retrieval might be quite tricky. So you need to be prudent in your clinical judgment in case selection, what size of fibroids would be really be retrievable through the camera. And uh, so, yeah. Right, so this diagram guides you through that. Right, so I'm going to uh, talk about a few things about the fibroids and the pseudocapsule, especially for the benefit of registrars who are doing uh, GeneNobs. So the pseudocapsule is a neuromuscular bundle surrounding uh, the fibroid in between the fi fibroid and the biometrium. This structure is well known and can be histological and sonographically examined. You can see it on your uh, eye. You are with your eye uh, when you are doing the surgery. So it's macroscopically visible as well. In a fertility point of view, dissection plane is crucially important. If you take out the neurovascular bundle where all the blood vessels and the nerves run through, it would certainly give rise to less myometrial reserve following the surgery. We are taking out parts of the uterus, the normal myometrium at the time of the surgery, leaving less myometrial fibers. So that would definitely affect the fertility and higher rupture rates following the surgery as well. So uh, it's quite crucial and be it an endoscopic surgery or an open surgery. So getting into the correct plane is one of the most important things. Several studies have analyzed the fibroids through the capsule. Thickness differs and the thickness is shown to be higher uh, uh, close to the endometrial cavity. So if you're very careful, you know that you have a certain advantage when you're going towards the cavity. And if you take care, you can easily separate the endometrium from the capsule through this neurovascular plane without entering into the cavity, which would count for higher morbidity. The cavity additions would be more. And uh, when you open into the cavity, and the rupture rates would be slightly higher in pregnancy when you open into the cavity. So all these things can be prevented if you are careful. And these little things cause a lot of difference to the patient, subsequent patient outcome. Because patients come to us with a problem, isn't it? So we shouldn't give them additional problems. In today's world, we should take every possible precaution to give them the best outcome. So during myomectomy, uh, recommends a systemic preservation of the pseudocapsule. I'm going to show you a video here. So this little thing is the myometrium, thinned out myometrium. And we are getting into the proper plane of the fibroid. This is myoma screw and this is an instrument and uh, this is the plane where the blood vessels and the neurovascular uh, bundles run. Yeah, you can see it's less blood loss. We don't get much bl blood as in an open surgery. You can inject a bit of vasopressin or petrocin and as you can see here, this is part of the capsule, the no, pseudocapsule. So it should go towards the side of the myometrium, not toward the side of the fibroid. See, we are taking only the whitish proliferated tissue out, the fibroid out. The rest of it should go towards this, the myometrium. So the next, next question is, how are we going to take out this large bowl of fibroid out? So there are equipments for it. Either you can, for a small fibroid, you can slightly extend the incision and take it out. 
or through a posterior culpatomy, or if you have the mosillator, you can use it. And there's a debate about mosillation, and we'll talk about it later in the later slides. Okay, okay now how can we go to the next slide? Fine, done. So intraoperative complications of laparoscopic myomectomy. Well, laparoscopy is not without complications, and uh, complications can happen mainly due to weak myometry following surgery after destruction due to extensive coagulation. So you should know when not to diatomize. That's one of the important principles in surgery. You don't diatomize like crazy. Uh, you need to preserve normal tissues as much as possible, minimizing the collateral damage. Excision through the wrong anatomical plane, as I explained before, can cause a lot of damage to the patient and decrease myometrial reserve, defective suturing and poor tissue approximation, uh, in proper selection of suture material and suturing techniques can cause a lot of problems. Uterine rupture is subsequent pregnancies reported to be 1 to 3 percent, which is very similar to a cesarean section, previous cesarean section rate, which is about 1 in 200. So, challenges, uh, concomitant pathologies, we were of leomyosarcoma cases. If you suspect leomyosarcoma, it always has to be an open surgery. Adenomyosis and adenomyomas would be quite difficult to separate. And capsular separation following medical treatment after, you know, uh, sperms treatment or GNRH treatment or even DMPA treatment could be quite difficult. And specimen retrieval, there are challenges. Mosillate or not to mosillate is a debatable question. So mosillation is the process where we take out these large fibroids through the tiny tube. So in laparoscopic myomectomy, uh, there's only one way these little pieces can come out, that is through the scope. And <clears throat> when you mosillate a fibroid, unfortunately, I don't have a video of it now, we use a special instrument called a mosillator. The job of this instrument is cutting this large fibroid into tiny pieces. It works with a mortar, automated mortar. So when you're doing this, tiny pieces of fibroid will spread all across the peritoneal cavity. So what would happen if it's a cancer? We are essentially converting a stage 1A cancer into stage 4. Yeah, so that has been the debate. Since 2009, uh, there were a huge discussion in United States and other European countries preventing mosillation. There were very famous cases about pilots and hysterists and other uh, professionals where they had cancers and converted into stage 4 disease where the treatment uh, was basically uh, unreachable. So simple surgery would have prevented them getting into higher grade disease. So mosillation, in my opinion, in some way of thinking, and uh, there is a school of thought, mosillation can still be done in a prudent way. If you have any suspicion, if you have any suspicion, this may not be a fibroid, well, of course, you need to go for an open surgery. But what about going for open surgeries just to prevent that 1 in 10,000, 1 or 1 in 400, 400 case of leomyosarcoma, and we are opening up 10,000 women to 400 women to, just to prevent that one case of leomyosarcoma. True, it's still important, but what about prudent case selection? You know this is a fibroid. Your ultrasound may help, your 3D ultrasound may help, your MRI may help. If you know that it's a fibroid, why not more sedation, which has certain, so much of advantages. So this is about it, the risk of uterine fragment. In most countries, even today, mosillation is an option. You can try bag mosillation even. You can mosillate within uh, the, the fibroid within a bag. So there wouldn't be any tumor seedling. And sometimes, even if it's not a cancer, these fibroids can, tiny segments can go and deposit in the rest of the pelvis and cause parasitic fibroids. That's another thing. So uh, FDA, uh, Food and Drug Authority in the United States has warned against electrical power mosillation. Uh, for indication for a laparoscopy, as I said, if it's not a large tumor, if it's less than 45 centimeters, you can try. If you have large number of fibroids, laparoscopy may not be suitable. Then we are moving into the territory of uterine artery embolization. It's one of 
It's not a new technique. It has been there for some time. But the problem with uterine artery embolization is we do not know the effects on fertility properly. So it's not one of the first line options for women who are awaiting fertility. Small particles, embolic agents are injected uh, uh, the uterine artery through a small catheter. Embolic agents then flow to the fibroids and lodge in the arteries that feed them. This cut cuts the blood flow to starve the tumor. Yeah, but the problem is following UAE, the central part can get necrosed because it's, you know, avascular necrosis. That can cause a lot of trouble, infections, pain, hemorrhage, all of these things have been known things. And effective in symptom control and 40 to 70% reduction in fibrin volume and 30% needed secondary treatment in five years. After five years, nearly 30% needed further treatment. However, majority had successful treatment. That's what the other side of it. Nearly 70% did not need any other treatment. And one to two percent of women can go into premature ovarian failure because it's all about the collateral uh, uh, vessel blockade. If that happens, ovaries might go into premature failure. So there's a question regarding fertility. So infertility, absence of long-term data, not recommended as a primary option in expecting women. So all these things have been compared to artery versus myomectomy and hysterectomy. Right, so we are moving into the inhibitor techniques. This is one thing, high intensity focused ultrasound, HIFO, and relatively recent non-invasive tumor ablative technique with the aid of special transducers, the ultrasound waves are focused on an area measuring just a few millimeters. In the target organ, this leads to high temperatures resulting in necrosis of the fibroid and dissolution. Over the last decade, HIFO has been widely used in specialized centers with highly successful outcomes. The advantage is obvious patients do not get scars. These are day procedures. They can go home on the safe, uh, same day. Basically, uh, advantages of avoiding a surgery. Uh, HIFO can be performed under the guidance of ultrasound or under the guidance of MRI, magnetic resonance. This is under the guide of ultrasound in this picture. Fibroids can be selective ablated without damaging adjust adjacent structures. These can be highly precise. The method requires minimal hospitalization, has no surgical wounds, and one-stop quick procedure, and it appears to be safe and equivalent outcomes in pregnancy rates, so there's no effect on fertility as well. This is the same thing done under MRI guidance. Yeah, this is an MRI machine. But the problem is these technologies is not available in developing world. Right. Then the other one is radio frequency ablation, RFA. Here, it's a hypothermic ablation. This is uh, a laparoscop laparoscopic ultrasound. This probe is laparoscopic ultrasound. This is a fibroid. This is the ablation probe. It goes in just like an uh, laparoscopic probe, gets to the precise point and give hypothermic ablation. That's radio frequency waves. That is a very... Uh, successful and upcoming technique as well. Right, uh, radio frequency ablation, alternatively transvaginal, uh, RF, transvaginal RFA can also be performed through the vagina. Uh, a study of current literature shows that most of the papers on RFA analyzed outcomes concerning women with symptomatic fibrils. They haven't really gone into infertility, so we don't know the effects on fertility there. Right. So to summarize everything, so clinical pregnancy, fibroids, and fertility. Clinical pregnancy rates were higher after myomectomy in patients with submucosal fibroids. If you have a fibroid within the uterine cavity, type 0 to type 2, it might cause problems in the pregnancy, starting from your higher pregnancy rates, less fertile implantation rates, uh, higher premature labor, preterm deliveries, and placental abruptions with due to uh, improper placentation. All of these things can happen. So if you are a habitual uh, miscarrier, then of course, uh, surgery would become more helpful before the next pregnancy. Subserosal fibroids do not seem to affect fertility outcomes and removal does not count for benefit. When the fibroid is totally outside the uterus, unless you have been having recurrent miscarriages, treating them and taking them out may not be helpful. But then again, if it's a large fibroid, 
you can think of removal because central necrosis can be really troublesome in a pregnancy. In contrast to submucosal fibroids, when the fibrosis is within the wall, intramural, the recommendations uh, yeah, can be a little different. So if there is uh, cavity distortion, uh, you can think of removal. If there isn't, if it's a small fibroid, you don't need to do anything about it. No conclusive evidence if intramural fibroids should be removed in women with infertility type 3 and 4 within the myometrium. Consensus is to remove intramural fibroids if they are larger, if they are more than 5 centimeters. Yes. If you want to have a smooth pregnancy without much pain, yes, you can think of removing. Of it, removing. And uh, implantation and ongoing pregnancy in women with larger fibroids more than 5 centimeters, intramural fibroids may not be really different. Treatment options should be individualized in each patient. Even though all of these criteria have been laid down, clinicians has to be prudent in selecting their cases properly. Uh, taking other symptoms such as dysmenorrhea, irregular bleeding, and pelvic pain into account. Removal before assisted reproductive techniques. The consensus is submucosal fibroids should be removed before ART or in cases of habitual abortions, subserosal fibroids, as they do not seem to affect pregnancy rates, myomectomy does not appear to be necessary. Intramural fibroids, controversial data, lack of homogeneous opinion, and intramural fibroids more than 5 centimeters perform surgery before ART or in cases of habitual abortion. Intramural fibroids less than 5 centimeters, the reported outcome varies between no difference and significant reduced uh, cumulative pregnancy rates. So, there, it is the clinician uh, who should be uh, deciding what to do there, with, of course, with the patient consensus. And, uh, right, thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the excellent and very descriptive talk. So, next, we will move on to the QA session. First question. Uh, sir, if there is severe bleeding, use of tranexamic acid useful or not? Yes, absolutely yes. That is the only effective method we can use for symptom control. Because these high fi drugs are not really in clinical practice that we talked about. You know, at least not in day-to-day -day practice, only in specialized instances. So tranexamic acid is the only effective method to control heavy menstrual bleeding. It's one of the wonderful drugs and uh, most useful drugs, antifibrinolytics are the first choice to go. However, NSAIDs, your brufen and aspirin and other things, even methanamic acid, might not really help uh, to control bleeding. But if there is pain, they might become helpful. Tranexamic acid to control bleeding, absolutely yes. Which, which type of fibroids are more common? Oh, that's a very difficult question to answer. Mm, these are mostly equally distributed and we uh, tend to categorize them in different uh, ways. As I said, there are many classifications, type 0 to type 7, more clinically oriented classifications for us clinicians to make decisions much easier. But fibroids basically can happen anywhere in the womb where there are smooth muscle cells it can happen the problem is it can happen out of the uterus as well in no relation to the uterus as well uh, let's say one of the ligaments let's say round ligament or maybe uh, 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 round ligament the extension which comes up to the labia majora you can find fibroid in the labia majora rarely how does that happen because there could have been some smooth muscle cells migrated through the inguinal canal up to the vaginal level. So in an unfortunate situation, that might proliferate and cause a fibroid there. So which type is common? It's difficult to say. It's equally distributed. Can happen anywhere. Um, so <clears throat> next question. So what about the recurrence of intramural fibroids? Is it common or not? It's not common compared to other places. Uh, there are studies which has compared the location and the recurrence rates. So there seems to be no difference, whether it's intramural fibroid, intra, uh, 
outside the uterus or within the cavity, the recurrence rates is almost equal. There's no real difference between them. But having said that, some of the trials I have seen quoting figures for fibroid polyps, small type, zero type fibroid polyps, they have slightly higher recurrence rates, but all the other types it's equal. Thank you, sir. Uh, since there are no more questions, we are going to wind up our session for today. Right. Uh, again, I would like to thank Dr. Diluk Sainadira on behalf of GMO and Sri for giving your valuable time and sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here. So, uh, have a good day, everyone. We'll good see you next week.